we know also from all kinds of studies that people can navigate all kinds of stress, including trauma, relatively well with resilience when they have a key other or others that they can rely on as a source of support. Welcome to the Couples Therapist Couch, the podcast for couples therapists, marriage counselors, and relationship coaches to explore the practice of couples therapy. And now, your host, Shane Burkle. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Couples Therapist Couch. This is the podcast that's all about the practice of couples therapy. I'm Shane Burkle. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm here to bring you the most up-to-date information on how to help people have a better relationship. So whether you're a therapist who's looking to learn more about working with couples or uh, a person who just wants to have better relationships, I'm hoping that this information will be valuable for you. I try to bring on many of the leaders in the world of couples therapy for interviews. So if you're interested in this, definitely subscribe and like the episode. I'd be really, really grateful for that. And if you're interested in the Couples Therapist Inner Circle, there's more information about that in the show notes, and you can click the link to find out more. So thank you so much. Please click subscribe, and I hope you enjoy the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Couples Therapist Couch. This is Shane Burkle, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Leanne Campbell, speaker, writer, EFT trainer, and co-author of a book with Sue Johnson called A Primer for Emotionally Focused Individual Therapy. Hey, Leanne, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Great to be with you. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm really excited to talk about our topic today, to talk about emotionally focused therapy in general, to talk about trauma, also about working with individuals in EFT. But um, why don't you start by telling us a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Well, as some of your listeners might um, know, and certainly you're aware, um, Dr. Sue Johnson developed an amazing model called Emotionally Focused Therapy as a graduate student at the University of BC in the 80s. And I had the good fortune of landing at the University of Ottawa as a new graduate student, and she was a new professor um, soon after that. So I was a therapist in some of those original studies, looking at the empirical efficacy of EFT for couples and have followed and worked with Sue since that time. Indeed, as we often say in our trainings, uh, we've been working with individuals, couples, and families in this model from the beginning, but it wasn't until 2019 when Sue wrote Attachment Theory and Practice that um, EFIT was more formally introduced as an aspect of the model. And then in 2022, we published the first text, as you mentioned, thank you, um, Cultivating Fitness. Um, and it was published by Routledge. And since then, over the past few years, we've been doing lots and lots of trainings in the context of individual therapy with a big focus on trauma because we believe that EFT more generally and most certainly EFT for couples and individuals is well suited to trauma mm -hmm. yeah, and working with trauma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And obviously uh, most of the listeners will probably know that emotionally focused therapy is a really well known for working with couples, but um, you're, you're saying that even from the beginning, it's been a really effective model for individuals as well. Yes, and we've just, um, well, not just, uh, we have collected all of the data, um, Stephanie Weave and some of the other fabulous researchers um, from the University of Ottawa and abroad, um, Paul Greenman and Robert Allen, have um, led um, the first empirical study looking at um, the efficacy of EFIT as an outcome uh, in terms of emotional disorders, um, such as anxiety and depression. And there are three sites, uh, we were one of those sites uh, that had therapists uh, participate just like we did um, you know, some time ago now in working with couples, and uh, we taped every session, and those data are now being on, analyzed with promising uh, results already. So um, stay tuned. Great. Publications are coming. Yeah, that's great. And can you give everyone just a little bit of an overview of what, what are we talking about when we're talking about EFIT, Emotionally Focused Individual Therapy? 
Sure, thank you. Well, EFT is considered a relational model, whether we're working with individuals, couples, or families. And um, some years ago now, um, Sue devised this brilliant um, acronym and way of thinking about what the therapist does in every single session, which is the, a set of macro interventions, the EFT tango or the EFT tango, which is comprised of five moves. So regardless of whether we're working with individuals individuals, couples, or families, we use the tango to propel the process forward. So we think about the tango as what the therapist does, and we think about the three-stage model as uh, the process of change and growth, again, whether we're working with individuals, couples, or families. So in an EFIT context, we only have one person in the room. In a couple context, of course, we um, rely on um, our key resource, uh, which is the partner. And, and that can become very complicated and difficult um, at times, especially at the outset of therapy. So part of what we do in couple therapy is we call it de-escalation, de-escalate the cycle, help our couples to understand what where they're getting triggered, um, what that looks like, how that impacts the relationship and creates distance in the relationship. In the context of individual therapy, we do something similar. We help our clients make sense of and understand the uh, patterns that they get stuck in, in terms of shutting themselves off from their internal experience, um, being unable to then coherently and directly share themselves with key others, and, and essentially being alone in the world, which we know from the great wisdom of a, the father of attachment, John Bowlby, and now thousands of studies in attachment science, that isolation is inherently traumatizing. Mm -hmm. So, um, of course, we know also from all kinds of studies that people can navigate all kinds of stress, including trauma, relatively well with resilience when they have a key other or others that they can rely on as a source of support, some place to lean where they can feel safe and secure and, and share their vulnerability and um, be soothed in the arms of those they love and trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so EFIT great, is great. the same. Sorry, I didn't uh, answer your question. We, we use the same set of inter interventions, but we don't have a, a partner in, in the space. But we still rely on key others. Sorry, Shane, you were going to ask me. Uh -huh. Well, no, that's um, that's good. That's what I was going to ask about as far as, you know, what does that look like in the session? Um, somebody comes to you and they're experiencing that, e well, either anxiety or whatever they're reporting or a sense of loneliness or something like that. And how do you use attachment and use EFT in order to help that individual without any other people in their life there? Right, exactly. So we first help them identify this pattern that they get stuck in. We help people move into what Bowlby would describe as frightening, alien, and unacceptable emotion. And for some of our clients who've endured trauma and perhaps are sharing their stories for the first time, even providing a coherent narrative can be difficult and things can be, feel very scrambled and chaotic. So part of what we do is slow everything down with our voices and our presence and um, as temporary attachment figures, key instruments in the process. And we help people order their emotion. And when people can order their emotion and make sense of their emotion and have that validated in the context of a safe haven therapeutic relationship, that, they, that emotion becomes more manageable, more tolerable. And then we move to deepening. And sometimes that doesn't happen for a number of sessions. In the EFIT primer, Sue talks about a wonderful client um, that she calls Henny in the primer. Of course, that's not her real name. And she talks about working with Henny for a number of sessions to just do move one of the tango, which is to really put up a mirror for Henny and help her to understand the way that she um, manages in the world emotionally and how that plays out relationally. And then as she sits with Henny and they begin to order her experience, both in terms of her narrative, but also her emotion, then she can move into deepening. 
And then we look for key others. Irvin Yalom has a great phrase that we um, get to know the key characters that live in our clients' minds. And um, from an attachment point of view, of course, we're focused on key attachment figures, um, key others who have shaped views of a self, views of other, and the way that people have developed these um, strategies for managing affect and their capacity. Sometimes when people have endured um, chronic developmental trauma, that these strategies become automatic and reflexive and are outside people's awareness. So once again, when we slow everything down, we can help people to begin to see themselves in new ways, begin to discover their internal experience, in new ways. And, and then we set up um, what we call encounters, move three of the tango. So in the context of couple therapy, we have the partner in the space and we wanna create what we describe as um, corrective emotional experiences or, or bonding events. In the context of individual therapy, we wanna do the same. We wanna create corrective emotional experiences in stage one of the model um, specifically. So for example, um, perhaps Henny has a key other um, in her external world that she has a hard time believing in or relying upon for good reason, given her history. She's not had experiences of trust and safety. And we might um, test that in the therapeutic context by creating an imaginal encounter. So we make the person real in the space. We get to know that individual. We get to um, see that individual. We make clear that we're there too, because again, as Bowlby and attachment science have taught us, nobody encounters vulnerability alone. So we make it really explicit with our presence and our voice. And we might even say, even when we're working on screen, and I'm there too, I'll be there in the background. So as you stay really still with you and begin to touch, some of that vulnerability that's never been safe to touch, never been okay to touch, and nobody to turn to. What, what, what do you imagine if you just glance at your partner? And then that gives us all kinds of information as well in an experiential way, not just an intellectual way about the capacity of Henny's partner to be there for her. And then we um, process that in move four of the tango. We ask, what was that like to share? What, what, happened, um, what happened inside of you as, as his eyes touched yours or whatever the case may be? Um, and, and we get a sense of whether there has been an impact. And if there has been, we want to highlight that, celebrate that, um, amplify that mm -hmm. in move five of the tango. And, and when you're talking about key others, are you talking about, does that have to be a significant other or it, could it be family members or other people as well? Sure. It could life? be, uh -huh. it could be family members. It, it could be a spiritual figure. Um, yeah. And early on, one of the things that we talk about um, in initial sessions is that we um, can maybe think of ourselves as guests in a person's home. And we don't want to just hear about their experience. We actually want to walk into their experience with them. And it's in that context when we actually walk in to the gardens of my beautiful client, Sierra's um, grandmother, where I get to um, see and feel and hear and know about her relationship with her grandmother, the various ways that she imparted culture and language and community and provided what Mario McAllister would talk about as an island security of security in the face of um, experiences that were not secure, but instead were characterized by neglect and starvation and abuse and trauma, um, both in her current context and her historical context and in the intergenerational context. So, so in that example, when you get to that point, where you're entering into the their world with them and you're talking about key figures in their life and experiences that they've had would you would you have already gathered a lot of 
data before like the background information of what they grew up with and what their family was like and their attachment um situation and their upbringing would you have already gathered that information before you get to that point where you're sort of going into the experience of it yeah, such a good question. Yeah, it's a great question because the way that I interpret and hear your question is, do I first assess quote unquote capacity or window of tolerance to actually walk into an experience? And so, so yes, um, we're, we're paying close attention to that. So in the primer, we talk about something called the care model that we want to use to tune into and find focus in initial sessions, but also pay attention to throughout the therapeutic process. And CARE is an acronym that stands for context. So tuning into um, the person's um, current context, their historical context, and potentially as well, their intergenerational context to re really get a sense of the world that they live and have lived in and the way that um, other aspects of their history continue to impact them, told and untold stories. And then we, of course, um, attachment as key. Um, EFT is an attachment-based humanistic experiential therapy. We tune into the key pivotal experiences that have shaped them. We think developmentally. So that's right. In the case of Sierra, I have walked alongside her. The, the session that I was referencing is a scene um, from session three. So that's right. I already have a lot of background about the neglect and poverty. Um, she talks about having been in addiction for years. So I have some sense of that. But I also have a sense that she's on the other side of her quote unquote addiction, to use her term, um, three years now. And she's, she's motivated. She feels like she has another chance at life and is doing really well. Um, she's taking care of herself in terms of, you know, daily living, and she has some positive relationships, some that are also strained. Um, and in particular, um, her key other has shared that, that they would like more closeness. Um, so, yes, you're asking a good question. And then the other element we pay close attention to, and especially in initial sessions, but throughout the therapeutic process is our relationship, the therapeutic alliance, which is always key, but especially key when working with trauma, when, when our clients have not had um, positive experiences of trust or minimal. And then of course, emotion, it's an emotion focused therapy. So, but you you also ask a good question about I, I I the way I'm listening is is a it's about timing it's about pacing which we're very careful um, about always but especially in working with trauma so just returning to that scene with Sierra in earlier sessions um, session one or two she shared about an inner child. And I'm curious about that because key from an EFT point of view is to create strong bonds um, that allow in the context of couple therapy relationships and the partners within that relationship to grow. The same overarching goal is um, so for EFIT, Emotionally Focused Individual Therapy, is to help our clients tune into themselves you know, sometimes we talk about come home to themselves, um, find themselves in new ways that allow them to move into secure attachment with themselves and with the key others who can help them grow. We grow and evolve in um, as our key others put up mirrors for us um, and um, provide us with opportunity to begin to discover and grow ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, if Sierra contacts you f for us as therapists, there's someone who contacts us and says, you know, my partner really wants more closeness in their relationship. I'm thinking about individual therapy. How do we help determine whether we should do individual therapy or we should do couples therapy or perhaps both? 
Great question. Well, if you have the luxury of working in an amazing group like I do, then um, a combination of both is often helpful. It really depends on so many um, variables, including um, stability, I think, in terms of one of the things that we think about around um, readiness for couple therapy is, is whether um, the, the relationship has the capacity to manage what is going to be asked of them in an EFT context. So part of what we want to do is help our clients. Secure attachment is basically defined as, you know, these core elements that we know from all the couple therapy studies, being able to tune into our internal emotional world, worlds, our fears, our needs, our longings, share that coherently and directly with a key other in the context of couple therapy, our partner, and give and receive love. So in, in the context of couple therapy, there's a challenge on both sides. And, and in initial sessions with um, some couples, it takes time to really slow everything down, get them to understand the cycle that they get stuck in. And, and sometimes it's useful to also have um, each of the partners or potentially one of the partners in individual therapy where they can begin to find themselves in new ways, which then give them opportunity to share and risk themselves in new ways in the couple context. So um, I guess in terms of a principle, I would say that whenever um, there's a reliable other that we can use as a resource in therapy, we want to do that either imaginally or, um, you know, in, in person. Does yeah, that... that's good. Yeah. I, and I like what you said earlier about the idea of safety, you know, mm -hmm. where if people have had traumatic experiences and to be honest, we probably all have had traumatic experiences on some level or another, um, that it's going to be difficult for them in, in the, the first part of the process where you're talking about even just slowing them down with their emotions, you know, that's going to start feeling really scary and vulnerable for people to do. And perhaps depending on the situation, there's a place for someone just to be able to do that individually and have the seat that would feel more safe for them for whatever reasons. And maybe in other situations or in another in another uh, part of the work that um, it'll be good to do that with a partner there as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. We can think about EFT as a process of discovery and sometimes it's scary to, um, you know, let go or dissolve some of these protective strategies in the presence of it. A, a key other, somebody that we really, really, really care about and value. Sometimes it's easier to do that in the context of um, an individual therapy circumstance that gives us maybe a bit more um, space to be vulnerable and, and begin to explore some of these key pivotal experiences that have shaped um, the way that we are in the world with our partners that we maybe don't want to talk about um, in that context, but we recognize that those circumstances are impacting this relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, to go back a little bit, I'm um, curious what you meant. You, you mentioned the word deepening that that would yes. be part of the process. And I wanted to ask you to explain what that would mean. Sure, thank you. Yeah, so if we um, think about walking into Sierra's garden and um, really joining with her and and making it visceral and alive, we're, we're talking about deepening the experience. We're talking about um, level of experiencing basically, which we know from all the couple therapy studies that in order to really get sustainable gains, we want our clients to be in a level of experience of four and above. And that's based on an experiencing scale that was done by Jen Lin and colleagues. And maybe some of your listeners are familiar with Jen Lin and focusing, but the basic notion is that in levels one, 
one, two, three, people are talking about their experience. People are talking about memories. They're not in the experience. And as our clients' windows of capacity or tolerance expand um, in the context of a say therapeutic relationship, um, be it in couple or individual therapy, then it's it's easier for them. It's less risky for them to move into their vulnerability and move into their experience in, in present process or in the context of beginning to share some of their earlier experiences um, as Sierra did when we walked into her um, childhood um, garden, her, her grandmother's garden. Mm -hmm. And so in stage one of the model, we can anticipate that it, that's not going to be easy to do and that's going to take time. And part of what we do is we, again, as we put up a mirror for our clients and walk alongside them into you know, their schools, their neighborhoods, their communities, their relationships currently, and, and walk alongside this couple in the relationship currently, then uh, as we are curious, so too do they become curious about themselves and about each other in new ways. And that expands capacity, creates flexibility in the cycles or the patterns that they've been stuck in. And then as we move into stage two of the model, which is what we describe as more second order change and really restructuring self and system, our clients have more ability, more capacity to move um, more deeply into emotion or experience and stay there for longer periods. And it's there that when shame emerges, such as um, it was all my fault, I must have deserved it, that all these things bad, bad things happened to me must mean it's about me, that that can really be challenged in a way that creates felt shifts. Um, trauma is transformed, people find their agency, and, and this organic growth process that we're um, wanting to kickstart um, really takes hold in an explicit way that allows the therapist to do more following than leading. And can you go over stage three really quick? Sure, um, of course. Because that was a good, I know this is a brief summary. You could probably talk a lot longer on these, but yeah, of course. Yeah. So in stage three, um, so thinking more about uh, Sierra, for example, um, in stage two, um, we find all kinds of opportunity for her to challenge this prevailing view of herself that was present at the outset of therapy. Um, and then in stage three, so we can really think about stage three as being integration and consolidation, where we celebrate the gains that the couple has made or celebrate the gains that the individual has made, where we um, highlight and elucidate those gains to be sure that our clients um, not only have a, an intellectual understanding of them, but a felt sense where they can begin to really embrace and see and feel and know themselves and key others in new ways. And we want them to paint a picture of their future in a way that allows them to capitalize on this more expanded, integrated um, view of self in the context of individual therapy and um, this solid relationship base um, that has the capacity to grow um, partners in the, in the context of couple therapy. And maybe in the context of trauma and especially you know, when maybe there's been an awful event, a traumatic event, we can also, you know, some version of quote unquote predicting relapse or preparing for symptom aggravation is what we often talk about in the context of trauma. So people can be proactive about that, anticipate that, recognize it not as a setback, but as a part of the process and the, a lifelong um, growth process. Yeah, it's very empowering at that point that they can make a plan, you know, and sort of expect that this could, ha this, this will probably happen again and that's okay. And here's what you can do when you get, you know, get to that point. That's great. Yeah, and exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, when you're in the beginning stages of working with someone, how much are you explaining the idea, the, the concepts of this, or how much are you just doing it? Right? Like, I can imagine sort of like 
times where I've asked someone like, yeah, and tell me more about how that makes you feel. And they're like, why do you want to know what I feel? Right. Like, yeah, um, what, exactly. what does that have to do with what we're talking about? Uh -huh. And uh, so I'm just curious how much you're sort of explaining the, the, why this is beneficial to people. Yeah, such a good question. Yeah. And just one other point that I, I'll make about, um, you know, working with trauma, many people in the field talk about trauma or sorry, loss, grief doesn't always include trauma, but trauma always includes grief. There's some sense of loss, either lost years, lost opportunities, lost relationships. So that's also key that comes up throughout those three stages, but particularly so um, at times in stage three, where people then begin to re-navigate and renegotiate some of these key relationships with parents, for example, or it might be with grandparents, or it could be with um, partners, whatever the case may be. So now, yes, you asked me, um, so how do we actually acclimatize our clients mm -hmm. um, or help them to get to know what this is really all about and, and why we're doing this? Um, so maybe let's stay with um, the example of Sierra. So, so part of um, what happened in that in that scene, in that moment, is I asked her about her inner child, and she and she said, "There's two images: one of a tiny little girl alone and lonely, starving, neglect, poverty, um, no food in the house, the smell of pot and beer. I can still smell that." Pot that pot and beer and notice as um, she shares, you can really feel it. And, and then she said, then there's this other image, this newer image, this more recently emerged of being cared for and loved. And, the, and that's where we walk into her grandmother's garden. And I make the decision to do that because part of what we want to do, and especially in individual therapy, when we don't have a partner in the space, is to resource the client. So I recognize that there's a resource here, this beautiful grandmother that I can now know and feel. She talks about her hands being firm but soft from hard work. She talks about the smell of salmon and berries, traditional ways of cooking over an open fire, um, her, her language, her culture, singing at the river, cleansing with cedar, and all kinds of beautiful, beautiful imagery that we can easily evoke in the context of um, later sessions and that Sierra can more easily and readily evoke as we've now walked into this experience between sessions over the course of therapy and beyond therapy. So then to return to your question, when we begin to move forward in the stage one process and we begin to enter some of these more difficult scenes, scenes of being alone and lonely, starving, neglect that she's given us a picture of early on and we've bookmarked, then, then we can evoke grandma as a resource. We can remind her once again that I'm there too. And, and then we can help her to move into some of this vulnerability. And that's right. Oftentimes people query like why? <laughs> and, and if I do, I'm going to fall apart. If I do, that'll be so traumatizing. And it's then that we might say something like, I hear you. Of course, it, it's never been safe. So but, and that's what this is all about, Sierra, is to give you opportunity, opportunity that, that you didn't have, that that beautiful little 10 year old um, in, in um, you know, the basketball court near your grandma's garden, um, not too far away, but, but she's not there, but you can feel her, you can feel her presence in the distance. So you notice how I resource her with my voice and I have all of that context. And, and then I say, and that's what this is all about to, to um, give that, that beautiful little girl, that 10 year old girl, opportunity, permission, um, capacity to feel what was not safe to feel. Of course, it would have never been safe to feel, um, but not alone. It, 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 we never do that alone, not, not alone. So you notice how that's some version of the EFT therapist, of the EBIT therapist, um, 
psychoeducation. We do it through validation. We, we do it in present process, and, and which gives clients agency, but also it, it's not a mystery. We're not trying to, you know, trick our clients into something. It's a collaborative process. And, and then we could say something like, as you're able, um, if, if, as you stay really still with you, what happens inside of you? As you stay really still with you. And that's a version of deepening, move two of the tango that we've been talking about. And then we want to set her up to share that with a safe other. That could be older, wiser Sierra. It could be the therapist. We could even evoke the grandma um, to set up opportunity to feel what was intolerable, unacceptable to feel in the presence of a safe other. That's the corrective emotional experience that we want to create, to choreograph, and then we want to process that um, in move four of the tango, because again, you know, we talk about assessment and treatment merging, and we want to determine whether that um, landed, whether that beautiful little 10 year old was able to take in the eyes of her grandma or the voice of some other key other, um, that the touch of this older, wiser Sierra who's there on the court too. And then we want to celebrate that and really um, highlight and contrast the difference between that, that experience and, and this new experience. And we do the tango over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How long? Well, I'm sure it's different for everybody and every situation is different. But, you know, when you're talking about going through these stages, what would you say is sort of a typical length of time that it might take someone yeah, it's such a good question. You know, when I, when I think about trauma and um, our goal, our overarching goal is to basically restructure self and system, help clients move into, which is on a continuum, of course, a felt sense of security with self and others. And, um, you know, the, these prototypical strategies didn't, you know, evolve oftentimes they've evolved in the context of chronic developmental trauma. So that's going to take time. So we talk about um, it not being quote unquote dose dependent. That's the other thing that there might be multiple scenes um, that our clients could move into multiple memories of trauma and loss and abandonment and neglect. But we of course don't have to revisit all of them. There's consistent themes that show up being alone, lonely, no sense of belonging, um, no, no place to call home, no sense of safety in the um, community or in the broader sociocultural context where there's discrimination and racism potentially. So it's really variable. Um, and oftentimes people do a piece of work and then they take a break and they live their lives and they grow. People grow both within a session, between sessions and over the course of therapy. So part of our job as therapists is to really create focus and momentum um, so that we can begin to breathe some hope into the therapeutic process and especially early on. Um, and, and then to structure it in a way that affords opportunity um, for ongoing growth within session, between sessions, over the course of therapy and beyond. And that's right. Maybe there is times when people will do a piece of work in individual therapy and, and then maybe the therapist will decide, you know, this would be a great um, time to perhaps work on, you know, your relationship on creating some of this um, growth within your partnership. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And uh, I think it's good to be accepting of everyone's individual process and how different that can be, right? And if somebody needs to take a break from therapy, that doesn't mean that they're stopping their progress. That's just the next step in their in the in their progress. So I think oh. it's a great way to look at it and to give people acceptance and to honor what people need at the time, you know, so I appreciate that. Yeah, mm -hmm, exactly. Yes. Yeah. yeah, well, um, I know we're getting close to the end of time here. Anything else that you wanted to mention as we wrap up the conversation? Um, no, I, I guess the only thing that comes to mind as you were sharing so beautifully about really being respectful of people's place and 
space and pace and what's right for them is we just finished doing a training and um, the organizer asked me the same question, kind of last, last words. And what came to mind is um, one of the questions from one of the participants is what happens when somebody's really quiet? And, um, you know, has never had the safety even to have a voice in a therapeutic context. And it just reminded me and, you know, doing all kinds of trainings over the years, um, just for us to have grace, grace with growth, um, grace with ourselves as we learn about EFT and, um, you know, experiment with the model and grow with the model. And, you know, this is what we always say as well. And in fact, there's even evidence to support it that, um, you know, when we engage in this amazing process and help our clients grow, so too do we grow. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And where, uh, where can people find out more about you and you, I mean, if you want to mention any, um, thing about trainings that you do or anything like that, but sure, at thank least you. your website for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, our website and of course, for sure, um, doing lots of trainings with Sue right now that are available on the ICEFT website and through PESI US and Australia and UK and um, yeah, with, with lots of different um, organizations throughout Canada and Europe as well. Um, or sorry, throughout North America, Europe as well. So yeah, look forward to um, joining with people and learning and growing together. Great, great. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, also, I wanted to mention, I forgot to say it at the beginning, that you and I spoke uh, on, it was episode number 79. So if people enjoyed this conversation, they should go back and listen to uh, episode number 79 as well. But That's really, great. Uh, I, I loved our conversation that time. It's been a few years, I think. And um, yes. uh, so I wanted to have you back on, but I'm really grateful for you coming on. And I hope that we can catch up again at some point in the future. Uh, grateful for you and all that you give um, to our community. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching the show. I'm Shane Burkle, and this is the Couples Therapist Couch podcast, a podcast that's all about the practice of couples therapy. If you enjoy the show, please hit subscribe, please hit the like button, and uh, you can continue to get all of the most up-to-date information in the world of couples therapy. If you uh, are some a therapist who's interested in learning more about the practice of therapy, or if you're someone who just wants to learn more about how to have a good relationship, definitely hit subscribe so you can get all of the latest episodes. Thank you so much. Also, if you're interested in the Couples Therapist Inner Circle, you can click on the link in the show notes. But thank you so much for, for watching. I'm Shane Burkle. This is the Couples Therapist Couch. <laughs>